Okay, so um, is it two years ago, the last time I was here? Two or three years. Two or three. And the weather was just as wonderful. But the last time I came to this conference, I, I spoke about risk assessment. Were, was anyone in that session? Anybody remember? Excellent. Okay, so the, there's a few slides which will remind you of that. Uh, but I'm best known for the, nowadays for the Kanban thing, and this time I'm here to talk about it. So uh, just another quick poll. How many of you know a little bit about Kanban already or already using it? Okay, good. So that might mean that the beginning here we can go fast because I thought I might have to do a few slides to level set people in the audience understanding Kanban systems. So here's a fairly simple software development workflow. And actually the Kanban in this board are the physical slots. So the, this is three and this is five. And this one is five and this one is three. And an empty slot signals that you can pull something into it. So we get pull signals from these empty slots. Right, so the, the, the empty slots on the board are the Kanban. This is another way of displaying. This is an identical Kanban system, different board. And in this case, imagine it's a magnetic whiteboard. And these are magnets. And now it's the physical tokens, the magnets that are the Kanban. But we can change the color of them to signify perhaps some kind of state or other information. And this style of Kanban board's been fairly popular in Europe. There's been quite a few case studies over the years from places like the Netherlands, Austria. Uh, we have a case study on our website from a Viennese company that has Kanban boards like this. And there's some really good photographs in that case study uh, showing how these are used. And then. This one is the style that we adopted in 2007 and the style that appears in my book, where you don't have a physical token at all. The tokens are now virtualized and they're just displayed as numbers at the top of the column. And between these three styles, you trade off flexibility for discipline. To use a system like this, you need to be a lot more disciplined about adhering to the number where if you go back to the first slide, if you only have physical slots, one for each ticket, you don't have to be disciplined about it anymore, but the <laughs> design of the board is not as flexible. So uh, that's what a Kanban board looks like. And the Kanban system comes from the Kanban tokens and the pool signals. Um, one of the key ideas in Kanban is that commitment is deferred, that there's some very explicit commitment point, which is often the left-hand column of the board. In other words, everything upstream of that is just an idea. It's some optional thing that we might choose to select or not select. And the, the act of selecting it and replenishing the Kanban system is an act of commitment that says, it's actually a two-sided commitment, that the owner of this is saying, yes, I definitely want you to do it for me. And the delivery side, the people working downstream here, are saying, OK, we'll definitely deliver it for you. And the implication of that commitment decision is that we would wish to avoid aborting it after commitment. If it had to be aborted, the implication is you weren't absolutely sure you wanted it, so why did you ask for it in the first place? Um, so we really want to have as close to zero an abort rate after commitment. Now, that's different from what might happen upstream, where the discard rates can be as high as 90%. There was a conference recently in New York where the Google search engine team talked about this stuff, and their discard rate's 75%. 75% of the ideas they develop are not developed into production code. So let's get past that. Yeah, this, this is the... Uh, the this is explicitly showing a discard box for ideas that have been thrown away, but I took that slide out uh, today for the sake of uh, time. The next key thing is if this is the commitment point, how often do we make those commitments? And we refer to that as replenishing the Kanban system. So how frequently do we do replenishment? And the frequency of this 
is the interaction of three elements, the transaction and coordination costs of holding the meeting. The more expensive the economic costs of holding the meeting, the less often you would want to do it. But the other side of the coin is what's the arrival rate of new information? In other words, the owners of these tickets, how often do they learn something new that might affect their opinion about what to start next? If that arrival rate's very frequent, perhaps every few hours, they will want to do replenishment very frequently, perhaps once a day. There's even a case study at a TV company in Brazil where they replenish the system twice a day. They use Kanban for uh, controlling the management of their post-production video editing. So it is not an IT application at all, and they replenish the system twice a day because new information about the script and how they want to edit the, uh, uh, the footage that they've shot with the actors, uh, that arrives very frequently. In order to hold a meeting twice a day, you have to make the cost of holding that meeting very cheap. On the other hand, if it's expensive, you wouldn't do it so often. And if the information arrival rate's frequent, the meeting's expensive and you don't do it often, then there's a mismatch. What will happen then is that the abort rate will go up. All right, so the key message here is that frequent re replenishment is a more agile way to run a business, and that's important if you have a high arrival rate of new information. It's not important if you don't. If you're running some very old, boring business, like say, you know, hot rolling steel mill, the technology of which was designed maybe 100 years ago, and it hasn't changed much since then, then perhaps you don't need to replenish too often. Perhaps you don't need to be so terribly agile. The other end here is the delivery frequency. How often do we flush the system? Now, in an ideal world, you would flush it on demand, uh, item by item. And certainly that technology exists in the software world nowadays. However, there are other costs. There are the transaction and coordination costs for the customer. The customer may not be capable of taking delivery as quickly as you can deliver it. So that needs to be taken into account. So there's a form of batch transfer on one end and on the other end um, as a compromise to the ideal world situation of you would replenish on demand and you would deliver on demand. So. Uh, yeah, frequent delivery is more agile, on-demand delivery would be the most agile, and in the software world for sure, th this on-demand delivery is reasonably possible nowadays. Even on things like space probes heading out into the outer reaches of the solar system, or fighter aircraft for that matter, where they can actually now upgrade them while the pilot is flying it, which is kind of a scary thing for me, as a guy who grew up writing software for a living. Right. The lead time through the system is defined from the commitment point until it exits the Kanban system. And exiting the Kanban system would be the point where you no longer have a Kanban, that you have an unbounded queue. And measuring this enables this equation which is a, a, a variant of Little's law from queuing theory that states the number of tickets on the board, the number of Kanban, uh, divided by that system lead time gives us the delivery rate. Uh, and this is the geometry for it. This is showing a cumulative flow diagram. So this is the incoming rate of new ideas that are uncommitted. This is the commitment line here when we choose to start something. And they may go through some different phases, some different activities like uh, design, coding, testing, or something of that nature. And then this is where they are complete and ready for delivery. So we have the quantity of WIP is the height between started and finished. And the average lead time, and actually this should say approximate average. Um, in order for this to be precise, a number of conditions have to be true, including there must be a zero abort rate. So if the abort rate is greater than zero, this is only an approximate average. The, uh, that is the, the, 
the horizontal distance between started and finished, and therefore the slope between the two is the average delivery rate. So the geometry matches the algebra, and this becomes very important if you're interested in forecasting how much stuff can we get done over a period of time. The question of, over the next six months, what is our capacity? Well, that would be you know, six months times the average delivery rate per month within some bound of variation, and over a six-month period of time, that would be maybe plus or minus 5% of the average because things regress towards the mean fairly quickly. And in things like uh, software development, you'll find that four or five months worth of data, you get very close regression to the mean. This little bit on risk profiling for those who weren't here the last time I was uh, at the conference. This concept is talking about the cost of delay, and to understand that, we need to understand the payoff for doing something. So imagine that we're creating a marketing promotion for a chain of hotels, and we have a, a marketing content management team, and their job is to load the promotion into our, our content management system. And that will then send out emails to our loyalty card holders, and there'll be web pages where they can register uh, for this particular promotion, where they can uh, book rooms, they can get a promotional rate, and perhaps they qualify for some other benefits when they actually show up to use the, the rooms. And if we were to do that for the Easter holidays, then this point in time on the x-axis represents Easter. It's the point where we will not sell any more hotel rooms for Easter. And therefore, when do we need it? When would you launch your Easter marketing campaign? And the answer would be sort of approximately the middle of January. So this would represent the middle of January. That's a little bit of a simple simplification of a sketch here because usually there's a small blip at the beginning. There are a few percentage uh, points in the population of people who will buy that promotion that will buy it immediately because they're just so excited. Right? So there should be a small blip there and then there'll be a, a tail here and then eventually the bookings will be taken closer to the time. Now imagine that we didn't, didn't get the promotion ready on time and there was some delay in releasing it. And when we do release it, we actually sell this many hotel rooms. So this is the rate per day and the total hotel rooms sold is the integral in the curve. Right? So this is what we thought we might do if we launched on time. This is what actually happened. And the difference between these two integrals is referred to as the cost of delay. Now, if you plotted this red area as a graph on its own, it looks like this. It's an S curve. Now, the shape of these cost of delay curves, it turns out that in some set of service requests or features or functions or projects in your portfolio, you will find that a certain collection of shapes become recurring that the things that you do in your business for that particular line of business have the same kinds of cost of delay shape. Now that becomes a really interesting shorthand because once you've learned some small collection of perhaps six or seven different commonly recurring shapes, you just ask the customer which cost of delay shape applies to this particular request, this feature, this function, this project. And then you might need to know over what time scale, but that's also not too difficult to know. In the example of Easter, we can easily bound it to early January to whenever Easter happens to fall in that year. This becomes important if we're interested in forecasting when should we start this item in order to guarantee it will be delivered on time so that we don't incur the cost of delay and I'm going to show you a demo of some very new software in a, a few minutes. And this software uses a combination of statistical analysis of lead times, Monte Carlo simulation, and an understanding of that cost of delay function in order to tell you the optimal time to start the item. In other words, at which replenishment meeting should we pull that ticket? 
and the, what are the consequences of pulling it earlier or later. So the, uh, the function I showed you a minute ago was a backloaded function. We like those because if we're late, we've still got a good chance of making uh, some money from this opportunity. On the other hand, there are some front-loaded functions where if we were late, we would incur a, a tremendous loss for a small delay. And then there are bell curve functions. And then th there are some others. This is not meant to be exhaustive. You get some which are basically just sort of unit step functions and some that sort of just head off into infinity almost forever. Once, so th this idea of understanding cost of delay and cost of delay shape, that is um, this axis on this risk profile. So this is one dimension of risk, and we could have multiple dimensions, some of which might be technical rather than business risks. And the talk I gave two years ago, I outlined all the different dimensions for this. The important thing to realize is that we can quickly assess the, the, the taxonomy on each dimension and choose a value and plot this picture for any given item. Once a piece of software knows this picture, it understands certain things. It understands sequencing information, for example, that on this market risk of change, table stakes features should be, should be sequenced first, and differentiating features should be sequenced later, because generally speaking, we want to defer commitment on differentiating features. On the other hand, unknown solutions that we might need to prototype, they should be sequenced early, because we want to prototype it and discover whether we can do it. And the smart thing to do with that is actually to break it into two tickets and create an embedded option where you do the prototype first, and the information from that that creates the embedded option on the second ticket, which might be a differentiator, which you then defer until a lot later. And a good piece of software would be able to track that one ticket is dependent on the other, and that one creates an embedded option for the second one, and that when the information arrives from the first one, it will alert you so you can make a decision about whether to discard the option or not. So generally, we plot these with scheduling information. So the way we plot the different axes is that we plot things that should be committed early towards the outside and things that should be committed later towards the middle. So that the, the picture visually tells us whether something is urgent or whether it can be deferred until later. And then perhaps we might need some simulation to decide exactly how late do we defer it. This is an example of one of these done for real. This is with a company called Bazaar Voice, which allows, uh, it's a sort of plug-in service for websites that allows you to leave comments, users to leave comments on websites. Uh, randomly, I meet people around the world, other clients of mine who are actually clients of Bazaar Voice. Now, each one of these shapes is for a different project or initiative at Bazaar Voice. The interesting thing is, the shape of this risk profile communicates the business value and risk of that project. Now, traditionally, we're taught to think business value is somehow some magical number, and that that can be placed in the numerator of an equation. And actually, it's not really true. Business value is a narrative. It's a complex problem. Because take a look at these four different projects. Imagine you've only got capacity to do two of them right now, and the other two have to wait. Which two go first, and which two go later? And here's a ripple on it. See this blue one that's been cunningly disguised with a false name? That blue one was a personal request from the chief executive of the company who came in one day and said, guys, I've had this great idea, and it's brilliant, and we must do it immediately. So the pale blue one here, if you look at the shape, on two dimensions, it would suggest, yes, you should do it immediately. On the other dimensions, it would suggest, no, you should wait until much later. And given the overall size of it and where it probes on different dimensions, is it really more important than the other ones that we could choose right now? How do you make that decision? 
Well, you don't plug all this stuff into a spreadsheet and then stack rank them by sorting a column. Instead, what you do is you sit down and you have a conversation about the pros and cons of each one, and you try to form a consensus around it based on the narrative of it. So this technique really only facilitates the conversation. On any one dimension, it's simple. Once you've got five, six, seven, sometimes we see eight or nine of these. I've never seen 10. But five, six, seven, eight, nine, risk dimensions to be considered in order to select what should we do, what should we not do. And often it depends on the circumstances. Sometimes there's something that looks like you should leave it until later, but you know what? It's really easy, and if we did it immediately, it'd be finished, and it would make the customer happy. Let's just do it, and make them happy, build a bit of confidence, and then they'll trust us to take longer on the other things. Okay. Next problem, we're still really thinking at the moment in terms of just a single Kanban system, forecasting. What we've learned about lead times through the system is that they exhibit Weibull distributions. And this is a real one from one of my clients. They're a big telephone equipment manufacturer and these people were making software for some sort of middle layer in the telecom stack, you know, so they're buried deep inside the platform of their telephone equipment. And this particular lead time graph was sampled over five months worth of data from the middle of last year. It exhibits a Weibull curve with a shape parameter of approximately 1.4. In general, the shape parameters vary between 1.0 and 2.0. There's a couple of outliers in this data that were special cause variations. What's interesting about this understanding that these things follow Weibull curves is that the mode, the median, and the mean in this data is all very low. The tail is very long. The tail's often four or five times longer than the median. And in some of the examples I've got, it's way longer than that. It's 10 times, 20 times, 30 times longer. Therefore, the risk, if you're managing the when will it be done by, or the alternative, which is when do we need to start it in order to deliver it before we incur any cost of delay, that's a really difficult problem. Because if the tail on this is, say, 10 times the average, that means you need to start it 10 times earlier if someone says, I definitely want it delivered on time. That's economically bad. Right. So here's a, this is more real data. This one exhibits a Weibull curve with a shape parameter greater than two, but don't worry about that too much. It also exhibits this period of 21 days where there are no data points. That's also relatively common. There are certain types of process where there's a minimum time before you'll start to see any arrival. And the 85th percentile in this one falls in this range of 22 through 60. But the, the back 15% goes out to 150 days. And the total spread of variation is 22 to 150. The average in here, I think, was 44. The, the mode is at 39, something like that. And the mode's at uh, 39, and the median um, is low 40s, and the mean is 44. Right, so enterprise services planning, whether you're doing it for one Kanban system or a cascade of Kanban systems, and I'll get to this a bit later, um, relies on two types of forecasting. Reference class forecasting. This is the idea that that sample of, of lead time in the histogram there, that distribution curve, we sample some period in the recent past and we use that to project the, the near future. That, that assumes that there is an equilibrium. I refer to that as the equilibrium assumption. That the system you're operating remains operating in the same mode from the data you referenced in order to predict the future. Reference class forecasting, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for this technique. It's reasonably solid. Then we have Monte Carlo simulation, and we actually use a combination of these two. 
And just recently, a uh, Bulgarian called Demiktar Bakarjev has introduced uh, uh, another technique which we'll see whether it becomes really core uh, to the forecasting approaches. But it's called random branch sampling. So he's been experimenting with random branch sampling as an alternative to reference class forecasting. OK, so uh, do we need to know this? Well, you get the idea. There's a mode, a median, and a mean in this data. There's a long tail. And this is the mean. So you see that over a large set of data points, and large might only be 50, then you'll get this regression to the mean. But if you have a small set of data points, you, you risk those data points being in the tail. And the consequence is that the delivery rate will be a lot lower than you might hope for. Next thing. You can measure the liquidity in a flow system. Well, you could do it. It doesn't need to be a flow system. It could be a batch system. But the, the liquidity is measured by the number of pools. Every time you match an idle worker to a piece of work that's waiting to be started, that transaction uh, represents something we can measure. And the volume of those transactions uh, measured over time represents the liquidity in the system. There's some other subtle things we can measure, like how long did the item wait before it was pooled? which is the same as how long was your house on the market before it was sold. The technique we are using here is identical to how they measure liquidity in the property market. This is liquidity data taken from software maintenance at the 9x exchange, which is part of the CME group, CME Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So these two departments were maintaining uh, trading uh, floor systems for 9x. And this graph is the number of pool transactions every day through one department, and this is the other one. This is the distribution of those data points. And this, of course, very hard for you to read, but this one baselines at zero, so this is zero pools per day. And the, the mode in here is three. The, the mean is also in there at 3.4. So this is 3.4. This little pale blue line is 3.4. You see some zero data points, and that's them showing up in the distribution. This is a different department, and this is their pool transactions and the volume. And this starts at 3, because the, the lowest data point here is 3, not 0. And the average going through it is, um, is about 8. That's this line on here. So number of pool transactions per day. You can't use that for comparison between one or another, but you can compare um, over time whether this is fairly consistent or not. This helps us try to analyze, do we still have an equilibrium? And what period of time should we look back in order to base our reference class data in order to do the forecast for the future? Well, an even more sensitive way to analyze that data is to study the volatility in it. So the volatility of the liquidity data is the first derivative of the liquidity graph. And this is that data. So this one is the derivative of the previous one on the left-hand side. This is the volatility in that uh, first of the departments at 9x, the volatility in the number of pool transactions in the Kanban system on a daily basis. And it varies between minus 5 and plus 7. And this is the volatility in the second system. And quite evidently, this second Kanban system is much less volatile than the first one. Now, the department and the department manager for this system B he spent a lot of time cross-training his people. He actually has a much more cross-functional team than the guy who's running System A. And it shows up quite clearly as a much less volatile system. And the spread of variation is minus 4 to plus 4. Now, this data is a couple of years old. And when we first saw it, we said, wow, that's really interesting. The volatility data 
looks normally distributed. I wonder if that's going to be true when we see some other data sets. Now, imagine you've got a signal like this, and all of a sudden you get a spike in it, that you get a data point out with the range of normal volatility. That's what caused the financial crash in 2008, right? when a New York investment bank noticed that over 30 years of trading um, uh, fixed, um, fixed interest rate assets, mortgages basically, that all of a sudden in six days out of 10 trading days, the, the, the volatility in the market had exceeded the normal range for the past 30 years. This put their collateralized debt obligation instruments at severe risk and they decided that they would exit the CDO market in a single day. That action then caused uh, the rest of the financial crisis to follow it. So they were using a similar modeling technique for understanding what's happened in the past and how do we use that to predict the future. And if suddenly we get a data point that's out with the range, then it tells us something bad is happening. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you have to close your company down, but it did have that kind of consequence in 2008 in the financial markets. So actually, we can use outlying data points in the volatility data to find the bounds of the equilibrium period in order to generate the reference class sample sets. All right, so liquidity and volatility are general health indicator metrics. They're like your blood pressure and your pulse if, and your weight. If all of a sudden there's a dramatic change in those numbers, something's going wrong with your health and your doctor will want to know about it. So now I'm going to demo, I'm gonna to have to switch computers here for simplicity and what I'm about to demo here is some brand new software from a company called Digite. They make a product called Swift Kanban. And what I'm demoing you here is the new capability that's being built into the highest end version of it called uh, uh, Swift ESP or Swift Enterprise Services Planning. Now, the data set that's contained in this demo is uh, all from their own product development. So we look at this, this is um, May, um, May of last year, I think, running through to September of last year. Now these are guys who are very good at using Kanban already, so they've got very smooth flow. Um, this top line is showing the flow efficiency in the system, and we believe that this data is inaccurate. But what we have here is a scatter plot of lead times through the system based on different tickets. These are user stories, this is defects, I'm not quite sure what the other three types are. Task, I mean, who knows what that's hiding. But there are five different work item types, and here are all the uh, data points. And this is the lead time histogram on its side. So you see the vast majority of things are completed in zero to five days, but some of them take up to 40 days. In fact, there's an outlier here at 50 days. So the, the average in this data is something like two days. The outliers in the data are out there at 50 days, 20 times the average, 25 times the average. Now, if I can get it to work properly here, let's, we can sample, we can just wand this area. So what I've done is I've said, show me this area. So this is the cumulative flow diagram for that whole period. And now I've sampled this and it's showing me just the, uh, the lead time data for that sample period. And then we can drag this one way or another. So this is a period just from looking at the CFD, it looks like it's a very smooth sort of equilibrium. And if we could maintain that, well, we could use that for forecasting, but you notice there's a couple of little blips in here. Perhaps that's something we also need to build into our model 
because over the time period we're going to plan, we might anticipate this happening again, or we might want to know what caused it. Well, this next chart shows the liquidity and the volatility, um, and it's for the same data set. Now, the liquidity data, just the number of pool transactions, it is kind of all over the place. And, um, unfortunately, the resolution on the projector is not high def, so it's rolled this over to the side. But this is the histogram. So this is days when there were zero pool transactions, and there's more than 20 of those. Days when there was one pool transaction and so on. And this is quite potentially Weibull distributed data, but I don't know that we've studied it too carefully. This is the volatility data. Interestingly, suspiciously normally distributed. This looks like it's building in to a reasonably normally distributed data set. And what we believe from this and some of the other ones we've seen is that you can do comparative assessment between different data sets because you can do um, standard deviation analysis on this normally distributed data. Now, what is it telling you comparatively? It's telling you that one department, one Kanban system, one software development team is more predictable than another one. If you value predictability, then this form of comparative assessment would be useful. If you don't value predictability, then you wouldn't really care. So again, we have the cumulative flow diagram. This is just a sort of pie chart of the different tickets. And the, the total, this is the total number of tickets. And again, with this one, we can wand periods of, um, if I can get it to work. Uh, for some reason, the JavaScript on this, there it goes. Right, so now I've selected a smaller period of time. And you see how the data varies. Now, actually, the whole period of time is more interesting. Let's expand this out again. If we look at this volatility data, see how this is visually more volatile than what happens in here. And then towards the end of the time period, it looks like it's, the volatility is increasing at least a little. This inflection point right here correlates with the departure of the development manager from Digite. The development manager for the Swift Kanban product quit the company, moved on to a different job somewhere else in Bangalore. And a new manager came in. And during this time, the new manager's getting spun up to speed. By this time, definitely up to speed. But actually, the period with the new manager is a lot less volatile than the period with the, the previous manager. I actually believe this volatility analysis lets us do the sort of uh, uh, industrial engineering, statistical process control stuff of matching changes in the data with actual special cause events. And the reason for that is that the liquidity, the transaction uh, volume of pools, is a leading metric because it's instant. It's not like lead time where you have to wait for the thing to complete before you get the data. That is a lagging indicator. So we can use this. Now, we don't have the technology yet to mathematically analyze this and take sample periods automatically. But we have, by visual human inspection, the ability to, to take sample periods and say, OK, we're going to use this sample period in order to build the model in order to forecast what's going to happen in the future. All right. The next one here. This is a cumulative flow diagram forecasting. Now, this is actually just showing the completion line on the CFD. And this is what's actually happened up to this point. Um, and you see that so the 7th of September is about there. What this has done is it's taken all the data in here 
as a reference model. And then it's Monte Carlo simulating what will happen over the next month. Now, it's difficult to see with the projector, but if you take a linear line here, an average, if you linearly project this, it will come out here at just over 180. This line on here, so this is actually the distribution of the delivery rate, the, this shaded area. And the mean in that data is here. It's maybe not quite normally distributed, but it's, there's a, it's reasonably sort of bell curve. And the, the, the average is close to the mode, so the, the mean and the, the mode are quite close. This red line comes to here. That's the linear regression. Now, if things went spectacularly well for you, in other words, if all the work you're doing in September and October ended up in the left-hand end of your lead time distribution, you could actually complete this many. Very unlikely, like a 1% chance, that's what will happen. On the other hand, if a lot of the data in here ended up out in the tail of your lead time distribution, you'll actually only complete this many. So we can use this technique to forecast over the next however long, one week, one month, three months, six months, how much stuff are we going to get done with what probability? Now, how risky do you feel when you're doing your planning? Just choose the, choose the riskiness. That, that, but given enough data points, the, uh, you know, enough time here, it will regress fairly close to the mean. Ah. Now, we can actually vary the, the time window on this, I think. If I can get it to work, yeah. So there we go. So this is using a shorter period of time. In other words, <clears throat> we might look back here and say, you know, this was a different development manager back there. We don't even want to include that data. So we're going to use some smaller window to grab the reference class information and then Monte Carlo simulate that. Now, it's moved the baseline on the chart, so the number went down to something like 93. But we'd need to figure out where that baseline is, how many things had actually been completed at this point, and add the two together. This next one is a very early demo of answering the question, when should you start something based on its cost of delay? So I'm going to build a cost of delay curve here. And I'm going to use a fairly simple one. Like this is um, a unit step function. Perhaps we have regulatory requirements that need to be launched on a particular day, and we want to know uh, whether they'll be ready on time, and there's some sort of penalty, some fine from the regulator. Um, this is all American date format here, so don't get too confused. So, this chart is the lead time data sampled in our reference period. This is the cost of delay shape for the particular function, and then mathematically, it's, it's running those two together, and it's building this forecast. And this is indicating the cost of delay incurred as a percentage probability. If we start the item here, about the third week of May, there is zero chance of incurring any cost of delay associated with this unit step. As we move towards the beginning of July, we get to a relatively high probability that we're going to incur that fine from the regulator. So if we're now asking the question, when should we start this particular ticket? When should we pull it into the Kanban board? The answer is not before the third week of May. It shouldn't even be eligible for selection until perhaps the beginning of May. The ideal time to pick it probably isn't even the third week. It's even a little later here. Because at this point, maybe you have a six out of seven chance of delivering it on time. And the, um, 
that might be the optimal time to start. What if you get close, you, you, you think you're not going to finish it and the time is shrinking and you're getting close to the point where you're going to incur the fine? Well, at that point, you could expedite the ticket if you really had to. So, for any one, func for any one ticket, this is interesting, but it's not particularly useful. What if we simulate this for every ticket in your backlog? Now the software can stack rank them at your replenishment meeting and tell you, in its opinion, it, its inference engine can recommend which things you should start this week and what the risk is of deferring them until uh, the next week or the week after. Between now and probably the end of September, we'll have that functionality so that the software will actually be able to start recommending what you should do, in what order, when you should do it, and if you want to play around with what-if scenarios, reordering things, booking them into future weeks, it will let you see the impact of those choices. This is what we mean by enterprise services planning. Now, I'm going to flip back to the PowerPoint for, for a few more slides, see how far I can get here in the remaining time. I'll need to exit it and restart. Actually, I can jump, let's go to this. All right, good. So, enterprise services planning. Professional services businesses, you work in one of them. These are businesses that build intangible goods. And those businesses are an ecosystem of interdependent services and often the dependencies are very complex. Now, let's pop up in the wrong order. In manufacturing, Kanban systems were adopted by Toyota in 1947. In 1964, Joseph Orlicki proposed something called manufacturing requirements planning. It was 11 years later before he published a book on it. And then that, that grew into ERP systems in the 1990s and the concept of lean borrowed from Toyota's stuff appeared in 1991. We started doing Kanban systems in 2004, and now, 11 years later, I'm proposing that we start doing enterprise services planning. Right, so what do we mean by this? So you have this constantly changing external environment, and that causes a ripple effect through your whole organization. Every time someone in your company who deals with the outside world learns something new, they change their opinion about what you should be working on now, when something should be started, how urgent it is, and so on and so on. So priorities are always changing as a consequence of this. There's also often a lack of alignment in between strategy and capability in companies, that they pursue strategies for which they are not capable of delivering, and the reason for this is they don't have actually any data to understand how their professional services work. Well, I've just shown you all the data you need to be able to understand that. All right, so the standard questions are, do we have capacity to do what we need to do? What should we start next? Will it be delivered uh, when we need it? If we delay starting something, will the capacity be available later? How many activities have we been running in parallel? How do dependencies affect our ability to deliver? Enterprise services planning is this concept of an enterprise-wide management solution that leverages Kanban systems and statistical analysis across a network. So, this picture is designed to simplify a much more complex business. Maybe this is an application-facing, customer-facing applications, a whole layer of them. I've met clients where they have five or ten of these in one business unit. And then they have a bit in the middle, often divided into several layers, and they're called the platform group. And then at the bottom, there are a whole set of shared services, database groups, user experience groups, sometimes testing groups, sometimes uh, vertical market, you know, specialist testing like uh, uh, medical testing and uh, medical devices 
business, or we have a client right now where they have to test the audio quality of their products. So they actually have like musicians who listen to the sound that the product makes and decide if it's good enough. Right, so, yeah, I shouldn't pop, right, so, the, there are two problems here. Looking downstream, you want the system to help you anticipate and manage dependencies. So, should we put something in here? And the problem is, what if it had dependencies on all these other systems? When is it going to come out the end? Well, if you can simulate this one, you can simulate this one, you can simulate this one, you can simulate the cascading demand amongst them. You can't really do this manually. If we don't have software to do this, it's not going to work. Right, and then the other problem is looking upstream. You want the system to help you anticipate and manage the demand. So if you're the manager of, say, this box here, how much demand is going to come from these guys up there, and when is it going to come? Well, it turns out that that isn't as unknowable as you might think that you can analyze the patterns in that, and you can anticipate it, and then you can allocate a certain amount of capacity for it. But again, tedious to do manually, and the scale of it is arguably too big to do it manually, so we need software. So the whole goal of enterprise services planning is to achieve flow across the organization by being able to plan capacity, anticipate demand, and so on. All right, so we have a couple of minutes left here. So we have some definition. To make this work, you need to be able to see your organization as a set of services. You're not reorging it. You're just thinking about it differently because you haven't necessarily thought of it as a set of services in the past. And then you can ban each service. And we have a way of doing that. We call it the static method. And then you build a feedback loop system. So services, here are examples. HR provides services across the company. Marketing provides services to product development. Um, IT provides services to customer support. Different feature teams and product teams have dependencies on each other. Many groups are dependent upon specialist individuals and other shared services. So these are just some examples. And then we have this approach that said, well, if you can see a service, if you can identify it, Understand what makes that service fit for purpose. Understand sources of dissatisfaction in terms of service delivery. And then we analyze it. This is stuff we do in basic Kanban classes. We design a Kanban system. We roll it out. We get it working. Kanban systems make these services more predictable than they were before. And now we have the metrics to really understand the dynamics of the system and hopefully use that to improve it further. Then we have these seven ways of understanding how the system's working. The replenishment meeting, the stand-up meeting, the delivery planning meeting. These three represent the Kanban system. Then service delivery review is taking a look at the data for a whole Kanban system and saying, are we actually delivering against the customer expectation? Operations review is doing that at the entire system of systems level, a whole business unit of interconnected Kanban systems. Then there's something called risk review, which is mainly about looking at the effects and the tail of the distribution, and something else called strategy review. Now, one of my clients decided we should call this collection of meetings lean data analytics, because you've seen that we have a lot of data to play with. Every time a ticket gets pulled in the system, we've learned something. Um, there's another way of thinking about it. These three meetings are about service delivery, and the rest of these, strategy and risk, well, those are things we understand. These two are about improvement, and altogether, all of these, all four of these are higher management functions. ESP is an entire management system. There are six planning activities, scheduling and sequencing work. I showed you some of how to do that. Forecasting delivery dates and expected outcomes. I showed you some of how we do that. Allocating capacity, managing dependencies. This stuff is going to emerge from further features in the software that I've already shown you. Understanding and managing the risk. We understand it from those distribution curves. Managing it, that means we need to understand what's causing the tail in those distribution curves. 
And there's techniques for that that I don't have time to get into today. Finally, ensuring sufficient liquidity to react to unfolding events. While we know how to measure liquidity, we also know how to affect it. I showed you two different systems from 9x. We understand why one department had greater liquidity than the other department. We can turn that into guidance. Now, if you spend money, for example, on training staff, you should see that pay off immediately in improved liquidity and lower volatility data. So HR want to know, did we get value for money from that training? Well, here's the chart and graph that shows the pre-training, post-training effect. I think we'll stop there because I'm out of time, but this just makes the point about fitness for purpose has a product component and a service delivery component. It's not just about the features in your product, it's about the way you deliver them that make people happy. So, yeah, this will do to wrap it up. Enterprise services planning about making your business fit for purpose one service at a time. It is very much the future of Kanban, and I'm really excited about it. <laughs>